Detroit is effectively the dictionary's definition of urban decay and poverty, yet images of the fading city somehow evoke emotions of nostalgia and curiosity. This is the magic of great cities beyond their prime and the expression of time's passage as offered by neglect. Inside that fading skyline is Book Tower, an abandoned skyscraper that was intended to be Detroit's greatest landmark, only to be ridiculed as an abomination many years later. Although stunted by the Great Depression of America and in tatters as a result of the decline of Detroit, this Rust Belt monument evaded the wrecking ball and represents a time when Detroit, Michigan was an icon to the world. This is the story of Book Tower. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start off at the turn of the century when downtown Detroit was blossoming, rapidly on ascension to becoming a key American center of business and commerce. Entrepreneurs from long and far flocked to the urban center to get their take of the livelihood. Being strategically located near natural resources and other markets via railroad or steamboat, there were few places in America more prosperous. To the west, the Union Pacific, which was founded in 1862, would eventually take freight thousands of miles to every corner of the country, when to the east you had the Erie Canal, which was completed in 1825 and could guarantee shipment to the east coast, but more importantly, beyond America and away to Europe. Although logistics were far from next day delivery back then, Detroit was as close as you could get. It was a total hotspot. So going back to that Detroit dictionary definition analogy, I would speculate that in the year 1900, some may have defined it more like Detroit, direct competitor of Europe in grandeur and prosperity. Skyscrapers and banks were appearing everywhere between the Detroit River and the Grand Circus Park, many of which still stand and are crucial in understanding the rise of Detroit. The progression of their designs as corporate America took hold says it all. So before we have a look at Detroit's great edifice, Book Tower, let's have a look at how the stage was set. According to historicdetroit.org, the Chamber of Commerce building was built in 1895. This building is Detroit's earliest standing skyscraper, and although it technically stands, it's nearly unrecognizable today after its exterior was mangled. Now it's home to the Archdiocese of Detroit, as well as 56 apartments. The State Savings Bank building opened in the year of 1900 and was projected by the legendary New York firm McKim, Mead & White, a company we have learned about in other videos on this channel. Although modest in size, this building represents a dignified Detroit and has survived to modern day despite having a very close call with demolition. You see, in 2012, a developer bought the property with the intention of clearing the plot to build a parking lot. Next, we have the Penobscot Building, which was constructed in 1905 and is a 13-story Beaux Arts style complex located in the Financial District. This building is a magnificent example of historic preservation and a stepping stone towards Detroit's preference of skyscrapers. However, in 1909, the flamboyance and grandeur and design started to really heat up when the Ford building was completed, totaling 23 stories in height with accents of neoclassical Italian marble. The industry that this design represented would be the making and ultimate breaking of Detroit, but thanks to the indisputable wealth of that industry, many other towers would rise. In 1912, the Dime Building appeared on the skyline, which was mammoth in size, a proud neoclassical structure which housed the likes of Chrysler House, Dime Savings Bank, and the Bank of the Commonwealth. This building can actually offer some great context as to why developers choose demolition as opposed to renovation. You see, in 2002 alone, a developer spent a whopping $40 million in maintenance, which is just the tip of the iceberg, a type of cost not unique to the dime building, and a pretext for the abandonment of the next great 20th century skyscraper on our list, Book Tower. 
taking its name from the famous Book Brothers of Detroit, who gained their fortune via inheritance from their maternal grandfather, Francis Palms, one of the wealthiest men in Detroit. Their concept was epic. The brothers attempted to revitalize what was then described as a rundown and ragged Washington Boulevard into an upscale and fashionable destination. Competing with the likes of Fifth Avenue in New York City, they would go on to control about 60% of the frontage on Washington Boulevard, but they wanted to make a statement that couldn't go unnoticed. Hence, Book Tower, their most special achievement began. Architect Lewis Kemper was commissioned, envisioning an edifice unlike anything standing. An ambitious conquest, as this was Kemper's very first commercial design. Construction started in 1916 and was completed in 1926. The building is 499 feet tall, 38 stories, and with a floor area of 483,973 square feet. Upon completion, it was briefly the tallest building in the city until surpassed by the Penobscot building in 1928. This tower was originally intended to be part of an entire complex with another 81 floor book tower planned just at the opposite end of the building. However, with the hardships of the Great Depression, plans were canceled. On the ground floor, there was space for shops and above it, there was office space. The finished building included 12 statues of nude women which appeared to be holding up the building's cornice. One priest from the St. Aloysius Catholic Church used to call those statues the wives of the Twelve Apostles. The U-shaped design allowed for ample sunlight to reach more offices. And that was probably the one feature everyone agreed was good. You see, when the building was completed, the reactions were a mixed bag. Architect Kemper was chosen in part because he was receptive to the ideas of J. Burgess Book Jr. Ideas that most architects would have laughed off. Kemper was ecstatic about this opportunity because he had just journeyed to Europe where he studied the architectural monuments of the past. However, after the building's completion, in the eyes of many, his lack of experience mixed with the arrogance of the Silver Spoon brothers who commissioned the building might have been a dangerous combination resulting in mockery from the people they were looking to impress the most. One article on the buildings of Detroit really does describe it best. It reads, Intricately carved Corinthian columns, florets, scrolls, and crests are all over the place. Horizontal bands of Italian Renaissance ornamentation break up the towering skyscraper with nude female figures gracing its midsection like a belt nearly from the ground to the top of the 36th floor. The building is covered in detail. Experts agreed. Kemper's strategy on Book Tower didn't work. His decisions had been ridiculed and criticized from the onset for not realizing the limitations of designing a structure that tall. He didn't take a fire evacuation route into consideration when designing, necessitating the addition of the unusual fire escape we can see going all the way down the tower. Kemper chose to use porous limestone that sucked up the pollution in the air, making it impossible to keep clean. In short, the vision was a mess. Detroit Free Press said that Kemper's designs were dismissed as clumsy, chaotic, corrupt and hopelessly out of date. Doug McIntosh, a Birmingham architect, said that he was a cake decorator. All of his buildings are frothy and decorated to the sort of outrageous level as a cake decorator would. In other words, prominent architects and experts alike considered him to be little more than an imposture, the equivalent of a cheap pop singer who tried to mask their lack of talent with autotune and dancing. Or maybe we should really frame it in a modern lens. Think Donald Trump's Atlantic City. Enough said? Regardless of opinions, Washington Boulevard was lively for decades in part thanks to this building. The streets were bustling, shops were full, and although the people of the real Fifth Avenue may have written off the pride of Detroit, the city had its heart. Well, that was until the morning of December the 14th, 1973 when Book Tower's luck would begin to run out. Sarah Watson Lazen, a 30-year-old local, ended her life by leaping out a 13th floor window. 
and in the process, she took the life of Raymond Donald, who was struck below on his way to work. Then a decade later, it was discovered that the antennas and satellite relays installed on top the building were suspected of exposing those below to dangerous levels of radiation. And although the radiation threat remained inconclusive, the equipment became conclusively dangerous on March the 19th, 1986, when high winds blew a massive antenna off the building. Miraculously, no one was hurt but this incident loosened several 300 pound decorative pieces on the skyscraper, calling for a brutally expensive restoration, restoration that no one could afford. The property owners began to default on their financial obligations. By May of 1988, Travelers Insurance, a principal mortgage holder of the property, took the building's owners to court over a $4 million debt resulting in the forced sale of Book Tower in 1989. Ultimately, the building was acquired by John W. Lambert, a well-to-do investor who had recently concluded a $10 million renovation on Cadillac Tower. Not unlike the Book Brothers in the 1920s, this developer wanted to bring Washington Boulevard back to its prime. And although the future of the tower started looking up, tragedy struck once again when the new developer took his own life the very same year. Widow Susan Lamberg took over the estate and invested millions to upgrade and repair the dying giant. But with a failing occupancy rate, a very creepy reputation of danger and suicide, things were becoming extremely bleak. By 1992, Book Tower was optioned for a trivial $2 million, and utility companies were threatening to cut off services to the building. To make matters worse, modern high-rises like One Detroit Center popped up in 1993, offering more attractive space in an already struggling market. Mrs. Lambrick finally threw in the towel on July the 25th, 2006, selling Book Tower to the Pagan Group for an undisclosed sum. Despite nice press releases and good intentions, the situation continued to spiral out of control. Even the new owners couldn't keep up with the expenses of Book Tower. By April 2007, unpaid electricity bills resulted in the power being shut off and many of the few tenants who remained left. And it's no wonder, imagine having an office at the top of a skyscraper with no electricity to power the elevator. Then in 2007, AKNO Enterprises took over ownership, only to fall behind on their own power bill by $87,000, and then another $20,000 in water bills. Soon, things went dark. Bookie's Tavern, a popular tenant, had its last call in Book Tower on January the 5th, 2009 at 2 a.m., leaving the skyscraper to be abandoned with the windows boarded up, the hope of Detroit lost, and Washington Boulevard on hospice. Finally, I'd like to address the elephant in the room, the aesthetic of the building itself. I'd strongly suggest that the architectural elitist who called this building ugly and compared it to cheap cake decorations so publicly show a complete lack of humility and sophistication on their end. Throughout history, art of the common people or PBN art has always enabled real people to make the small illusion of being in a social class that would have always otherwise been out of reach for them. Mocking real people, especially when you have the means for the real thing yourself, is in very poor taste. Furthermore, isn't this an authentic way for an inexperienced American architect to embrace his European inspirations? So what happens when cities side on historic preservation and the integrity of their local heritage over a new parking lot, a shopping mall, or other modern and brightly colored gimmicks? Well. Sometimes we have a legacy to pass on to the next generation. In other cases, we get abandoned skyscrapers, or just maybe we can see a city returned to its prime. So at what price do we compromise? Should we really trade our skyscrapers for trinkets? I'd like to end this video with something of a poll. If you think Book Tower is beautiful, Share this video. I'd be very curious to see what percentage of you appreciate imperfection in art and architecture. 
Also, support the channel by subscribing. Check out our series, Tales of Urban Decay, as well as our daily stories. This is Ryan Sokash signing off.